There's a plant growing wild across North America that has cured hundreds, killed just as many, stained battle letters, and once inspired Elvis to get funky on national TV. It's been used as food, ink, and medicine, but still manages to confuse foragers every spring, because if you cook it wrong, it might just take you with it. I'm Megan Bram, and on this episode of The History of Plants, we're digging into the strange survivalist saga of Phytolaca americana, better known as pokeweed, a backyard weed that refuses to be tamed, and it might be the most contradictory plant in American history. So let's go back to the beginning. Before it was pickled, poisoned, or pressed lead, pokeweed was just there, quietly growing along fence lines and forest edges, waiting to be used for healing or for harm. Pokeweed, Phytolaca americana, is a beast of a perennial native to eastern North America. Its genus name, Phytolaca, comes from Greek and Latin, phyto meaning plant, and laca meaning crimson or lacquer, thanks to the plant's deep staining juice. The species name americana, that one's obvious. The plant is so American and has a country fair food named after it, but we'll get to that later. Pokeweed belongs to the Phytolacaaceae family, a group of flowering plants mostly native to the tropics. But this one carved out its own legacy across the North American landscape. Members of the family are known for their toxic saponins, bright berries, and a talent for thriving in disturbed habitats. Basically, plants that move in when humans make a mess. You'll find pokeweed stretching from the Gulf Coast to the Midwest and into parts of southern Canada. It thrives in chaos, crushed fields, roadside ditches, abandoned lots, even my neighbor's unruly side yard. It's what botanists call a pioneer species, one of the first plants to spring up after a fire, farming, or upheaval. And that tenacity made it a visible presence for both archaeologists and indigenous cultures. The name poke comes from Algonquin words like pukam, pokan, pokun, terms tied to plants that were used for dye. On past episodes, I have covered botanical histories that span hundreds of thousands of years, sometimes back to the dawn of humanity and even earlier. But what's interesting is that we have very little of that for our pokeweed. The earliest confirmed archaeological evidence of pokeweed use dates to around the first century CE, with seeds recovered from ancient hearths and settlement sites across the eastern woodlands. However, Pipe fragments containing botanical residue that were radiocarbon dated to roughly 900 BCE suggest that pokeweed may have been growing right alongside early tobacco, even if it wasn't directly smoked. God, I hope it wasn't directly smoked. Which leads us to who used it and how. That depends on who you ask. For the Cherokee, who called it Saihika, pokes signaled the end of winter and the start of renewal. Every spring, they'd gather young leaves from the stalks and boil them two to three times with water changes to neutralize the toxins. Once fully cooked, the leaves shrank and softened, taking on a texture that's kind of similar to spinach. The resulting dish, called poke salad, was often fried in bacon grease with eggs scrambled in at the end. Sounds like a pretty good breakfast. But it wasn't just about taste. The leaves were sometimes bundled and dried for future use. Some traditions involved swallowing a single berry daily to ward off arthritis. In the Choctaw language, pokeweed was known as kashiba, while the Seneca called it oshia. Pamnaki boiled berries to help cure rheumatism. The Delaware dried and roasted the root to treat throat infections and fungal conditions. Tribes in Virginia used it for cancer and joint pain. The Paiute fermented the berries into a narcotic tea used for sedation. The Mahuna used the roots for headaches and the leaves to treat pimples and blackheads. So this plant was just super versatile. But then there's the spiritual side. Some indigenous communities wore pokeberry beads to ward off illness or evil spirits. Others used the vibrant juice for body markings, purification rituals, or coloring ceremonial tools in sacred bundles. The yellow dye from mature leaves and the reds and purples from the berries marked everything from clothing to horses, to even weapons. Because poke grew easily and returned each year, it became a symbol of resilience in many oral traditions. It was associated with protection, transformation, and balance. Wild, yes, but also healing, if handled with respect. In some beliefs, the violent purging it caused was not seen as a drawback, but a form of spiritual cleansing, driving out both toxins and evil spirits. But not all tribes embraced it. The Alabama reportedly called Europeans chakvalaka umpisa, meaning those who eat pokeweed, implying they avoided it themselves. That hesitation might actually reflect the difficulty of processing poke before metal cookware became widely available. Boiling something multiple times wasn't easy in clay. So while poke's medicinal uses may stretch back centuries, its role as food 
likely gained traction after European contact. And that's where the story shifts. Because once colonists got their hands on it, pokeweed would get a little more complicated. By the time European colonists encountered pokeweed, indigenous communities had already had spent generations learning how to use it and how not to. But as settlers pushed deeper into North America, they began adopting those same risky rituals. Boil it long enough and it's food. Crush it just right and it's medicine. Handle it wrong and it's poison. By the way, if you're into historical mysteries hiding right in your backyard, Subscribing to this channel is probably a pretty good move. In the 18th century, archaeologists discovered pokeweed seeds in quarters of enslaved people at George Washington's Mount Vernon estate, suggesting the plant remained a staple even under brutal, inhumane conditions. How this knowledge transferred, whether it was shared, observed, or independently discovered, is unclear, but enslaved African Americans began using poke both as a food of necessity and, perhaps, as a small act of control. When so much of life is dictated by violence, knowing how to cook a toxic plant into something nourishing was a powerful kind of knowledge. Colonial physicians took note, too. Pokeweed appeared in early American medical texts like King's American Dispensatory, where it was listed as a potent emetic and cathartic, basically a botanical reset button for your digestive system. If, big if, you didn't mind the violent purging. Dried poke root was sold in apothecaries and prescribed for everything from syphilis to glandular swellings to cancer. Whether or not it worked depended entirely on your dose and your luck. But as medicine modernized and chemical compounds replaced folk brews, pokeweed was quietly pushed off the pharmacist's shelf. Its place instead was preserved in stories, both the cultural kind and the culinary. During the Great Depression, poke salad became a lifeline for so many people. Poor rural families across the South and Appalachia foraged it each spring, boiling the leaves and pan-frying them in bacon grease. It was nicknamed Poverty Greens, and it kept people fed when grocery money dried up. The legacy still lives on in towns like Harlan County, Kentucky, where the annual poke salad festival draws visitors from across the region. There's music, dancing, pageants, and yes, even a poke salad eating contest. The same plant that once symbolized desperation now crowns beauty queens and parades throughout town. Pokeweed also crept into American pop culture. In 1968, Louisiana musician Tony Joe White wrote Polk Salad Annie, a swampy blues rock ode to a poor Southern girl. Elvis Presley later covered the song in his bedazzled Vegas jumpsuit phase. The plant had officially entered the Southern Gothic canon, equal parts folklore, funk, and (laughs) fatalism. And then there's the ink. Crushed poke berries make a vivid red-purple dye that was used throughout American history as writing ink. Some say Thomas Jefferson drafted parts of the Constitution with pokeberry ink on hemp. Confederate soldiers wrote home with it when commercial inks ran out. And we can still read those letters to this day. In the 1800s, some American schoolchildren were taught how to make their own ink from pokeberries. And today, a few mystery novelists and herbal enthusiasts still do boiling down the berries into a homemade sort of blood ink that is more aesthetic than archival. And while this was all happening in the U.S., pokeweed was making its way to Europe. Early colonists, enchanted by its deep red pigment, brought the seeds back across the Atlantic. It appeared in European gardens by the early 1700s, and in 1753, Swedish botanist Carl Linnaeus formally classified it in Species Plantarum as Photolica Americana. Victorian households dabbled with the plant as a dye source, using its root and berry juice to color textiles, paper, and even cosmetics. Pokeweed's most notorious European chapter came in the 19th century, when shady winemakers used its juice to deepen the color of cheap red wine. The trick worked, until regulators realized consumers were unknowingly drinking a poison. Consequently, the practice was banned, but by then, poke had gone feral, naturalizing in parts of Europe, Australia, and New Zealand. It is now considered invasive in all of these regions because of that. So whether it was being boiled for dinner, smeared on a love letter, strummed to a rock song, or snuck into a wine barrel, pokeweed kept showing up as useful, as dangerous, as unforgettable. And it wasn't done with us yet. If pokeweed had a resume, it'd be filed under extremely qualified to ruin your day. Its entire chemical profile reads like a hazard manual, 
with just enough scientific promise to keep labs poking at it for decades. Let's start with the headline compounds. The berries and roots are packed with triterpenoid saponins, especially phytolacotoxin and phytolycoagenin. These disrupt cell membranes and cause gastrointestinal chaos. Think vomiting, cramping, diarrhea, making the plant toxic to nearly all mammals, including us. Fetal poisonings have occurred from adjusting improperly prepared greens or from curious children unfortunately mistaking the berries for edible fruit. But pokeweed isn't just a danger, it is also a research goldmine. In 1971, scientists isolated a new class of proteins from the root, pokeweed antiviral proteins, or PAPs. These are ribosome-inactivating proteins, enzymes that remove a specific adenine, effectively halting protein synthesis and triggering cell death. The most studied version is PAP1, which specifically targets viral-infected cells. It showed early promise in lab trials against HIV, herpes, and certain cancer cell lines. In the 1980s and 90s, PAP was hyped as a possible AIDS treatment until animal trials failed lost its refiled, and pharmaceutical interest evaporated. Even so, PAP research has not stopped. More recent work has uncovered a variant called PAPH, purified from the hairy root cultures of pokeweed, and its release is enhanced by ethylene induction, the same stress signal that triggers fruit ripening. PAPH has been shown to penetrate fungal cells and depurinate fungal ribosomes, especially when combined with other secreted enzymes like chitinase and gluconase. That makes it a potential player in antifungal bioengineering, and it is not alone. Pokeweed roots contain pokeweed mitogen, PWM, a glycoprotein that hyperstimulates immune cells, specifically B lymphocytes. PWM is still used today in immunology labs to test immune system activity and has been explored for therapeutic applications in immune disorders and even vaccines. But in the wild, this kind of immune stimulation is exactly what makes the plant so reactive and dangerous when ingested. Beyond the toxic and immunological profiles, pokeweed boasts a surprisingly nutritional resume if, and only if, you cook it correctly. Properly boiled young shoots contain vitamin C, iron, antioxidants, and about 2 grams of protein per 100 grams. That nutrient density helped it earn a place in survival food traditions, especially during the Great Depression and wartime rationing. And then there's the ink. The vivid purple stain from poke berries comes from beta-cyanins, which are water-soluble pigments more commonly found in beets. These give pokeweed its distinctive color and the stain's sticking power like we've seen in the Civil War letters. Modern studies are still uncovering new bioactive compounds in Phytolica americana. In 2014, a study found that crude extracts from the aerial roots of pokeweed inhibited the growth of the two main bacterial culprits behind periodontal disease and tooth decay. Researchers credited the effect to natural compounds like camphorol, quercetin, and ferulic acid, all present in the plant. Meanwhile, a 2017 study found that pokeweed has over 97,000 active genes. Many of them it can turn on to protect itself when it faces pollution from toxic metals like cadmium. One gene, PAGT3, encodes a glucosotransferase enzyme that was recently used to synthesize glycosylated resveratrol, the antioxidant found in red wine by modifying E. coli to produce novel therapeutic compounds. That's all pretty, like, high-level scientific. All it really means is that the things in pokeweed have been able to engineer probiotic drug candidates inside a microbe. But not all consequences have been therapeutic. In the late 1800s, poke root elixirs were aggressively marketed as weight loss and cancer cures. These unregulated tonics, which were essentially just toxic infusions of the plant, led to widespread poisonings and eventually... FDA crackdowns under the Pure Food and Drug Act of 1906. Later, the U.S. military even funded research into pokeweed's antiviral potential as part of a bioweapons defense program. So what we're left with is a plant that kills cells for a living, yet might still help save them. A toxic perennial with a bad reputation and an impressive set of credentials. But pokeweed's story doesn't end there either. In fact, it's just getting started. Pokeweed has always been hard to categorize. It's medicinal, but it's toxic. It's a nuisance, but it's really beautiful. And even now, decades after the last wave of mainstream popularity, scientists still haven't figured out whether it's a miracle plant or a biochemical booby trap. For gardeners, land managers, and farmers, it remains a villain. Pokeweed is considered invasive not only in the U.S., but as I said before, also in Australia, New Zealand, and much of Europe, where it escaped ornamental gardens and now outcompetes native flora. 
Its deep taproot makes it hard to remove, and its poisonous leaves and berries pose a hazard to livestock, pets, and children. The USDA listed it as a noxious weed, and in several states, eradication is ongoing. Yet in the scientific world, pokeweed never fully disappeared. Researchers still continue to explore how its compounds might help treat cancer, HIV, and even agricultural viruses. Some labs are engineering PAP proteins into crop lines to enhance viral resistance. Others remain cautious, concerned about potential toxicity to humans and non-target species. In immunology, pokeweed mitogen is still used to stimulate white blood cells in research settings, helping scientists study immune response and autoimmune disease mechanisms. If you've ever participated in a study involving B cell stimulation, poke may have been involved, quietly working in the background. And strangely enough, it's in the least likely places that pokeweed has revealed its most surprising talents. In urban agriculture, pokeweed has shown promise as a hypoaccumulator, a plant that naturally pulls heavy metals like lead and cadmium out of contaminated soil. Field trials are testing its ability to clean up polluted land through phytoremediation, reducing the need for excavation or synthetic chemicals. And as climate change accelerates ecosystem disruption, Researchers are training to resilient pioneer species like pokeweed to understand how plants adapt to harsh or unstable environments. What is it that gives poke its edge? What survival mechanisms can we learn from it? Meanwhile, pokeweed lives on in folk culture and fringe practices. On TikTok, foragers debate proper cooking methods. Herbalists argue over the line between remedy and risk. Artists still boil berries into vibrant but impermanent ink staining paper, wood, and fabric with the same color once used to write Civil War letters home. The color fades over time, but maybe that's part of its appeal. For all of its contradictions, pokeweed persists. It doesn't ask to be liked or cultivated. It simply returns year after year, sprawling through neglected lots, laboratory notebooks, and generational memory. Maybe Poke's final lesson isn't just in what it hides, but in how it endures. And Megan Brame, thank you for joining me on another episode of The History of Plants. Jump into the commentary episode on Patreon for bonus content, or if you're ready to check out another plant with poisonous paradoxes, check out the Henbane episode. It's a plant that shaped mythology, medicine, and maybe even murder. Until next time, greenies, stay curious, and don't forget to flourish. Flourish.